It's like every movie you've ever seen of a maximum security prison with the razor wire and the, the big watchtowers. The triple razor wire walls, electrified fence. The smell, the sound. <laughs> Everything's so loud in prison. It's a pretty um, unnerving kind of place. I was taken aback. I, had, I wasn't really prepared. Donaldson Prison in Bessemer is among the toughest maximum security lockups in Alabama. We, have a, we hold about 1,500 inmates, uh, give or take a few uh, on a daily basis. We have a death row housing unit here. We, we deal with mental health. Um, and we, we mainly deal with uh, inmates that are, that are maximum custody inmates, inmates that are uh, troublesome at other institutions. It has a dangerous reputation. We continue to follow a developing situation at Donaldson Prison in Bessemer. The prison remains on lockdown tonight after an inmate stabbed another inmate to death over the weekend. Since 2011, there have been four homicides and 54 assaults by inmates at Donaldson Prison. The prison's infamy may be best explained through its namesake. Officer William E. Donaldson was killed on the job by a death row inmate in 1990. He used, uh, I'm assuming, a homemade weapon of some type of knife. Donaldson was rushed to the hospital but didn't make it. Back then, the prison was the West Jefferson Correctional Facility but was renamed for Donaldson the following year. The prisoner who killed Donaldson later hung himself in his cell. Officer Donaldson's death is a reminder of the risk correctional officers face every day. At this ceremony in 2010, Donaldson is missed and is honored for his sacrifice at the prison that now bears his name. What kind of crimes lead men to live behind these walls? You see robbery, you see murder, we see manslaughter, um, a lot of horrific uh, natured crimes in here, and, and they're here often here for a very long time. What is life like for the men sentenced to hard time here? When they wake up in the morning, the only thing they really see is each other. If they live in a cell block, when they wake up in the morning, they see four walls. The, the depression in here, the loneliness, it's just, it, it eats you up. There's an urban legend or myth out there that somehow they're luxurious. There is no luxury in these prisons, I promise you there's no luxury, and no one's advocating that there should be. It is extremely hot for most of the year. There is no air conditioning. A lot of people live in cells that are, you know, just like concrete boxes that have practically no ventilation. There's very few programs, very few things to do. Even as somebody who works there, there's that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, and it's just like, these people are locked away. I know a lot of guys like me, you get to start feeling like, you know, you're alone, that you're dealing with this by yourself. And uh, that's not a good feeling to be alone, especially when you're struggling for survival, struggling to get your life back. Hey, we love to lock up people and throw away the key, even nonviolent offenders. Alabama's prison system is in crisis. Alabama has the third highest incarceration rate in the country. The state system is at 183% capacity. The problem we had was we were creating new crimes every year, new laws for new crimes, but we weren't funding how you punish those crimes. From 1978 to 2015, Alabama's prison population increased 467%, making it the most crowded state prison system in the nation. No new construction. We weren't hiring any new officers. We weren't funding their staffing or their supply needs. So what happened was you ended up with a system that's woefully overcrowded. Any facility is sort of like a self-contained organism. And when you have one part of that organism that's out of whack because it's not healthy, the whole organism suffers. Years of overcrowding and understaffing have led to primitive conditions inside. We don't have enough guards. 
we don't have enough programs, our prisons are falling apart, we're not providing adequate medical care or mental health care. So the prisons are just a mess and they are a tinderbox. It's difficult to recruit new staff when the work environment is dangerous and security is astonishingly poor. Right now we're doing it cheaper in Alabama, our prison system, per capita, we do it cheaper than anybody else in the country. You can't do it any cheaper than us. Alabama spends less money per inmate than any other state, $47 a day. The national average is 80. The state's recidivism rate is 33%. That means about a third of prisoners who get out in Alabama will reoffend. A lack of resources creates a vicious cycle. The overcrowding and the understaffing oftentimes works against us in being able to rehabilitate our inmates, which has the double impact of keeping our recidivism rate high because they don't leave prepared to be successful in society. 98% of all prisoners in Alabama will get out, and 90% will get out just within a few years. So the question is, what are you going to do with the people while they're in prison to reduce the chance that they're going to re-offend? Uh, we're trying to change our culture of the way society sees uh, uh, pri prison or the penitentiary. Um, it's not all bad. There are a lot of positive things going on inside the institutions. One positive thing has been going on at Donaldson since 1988. Every other week, a different faculty or staff member from UAB steps out of the world of academia into no. this. It shows most of the metal. Volunteers providing a one-time academic lecture on any topic that they're passionate about, and their students are prisoners. We learned about agriculture, we learned about um, physical health, we learned about mental health. The Greeks, the Romans, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. The education in Africa that predated Kunta Kinte. The people from the medical center would talk about some strange disease. Biologists and chemists would talk about quite technical things. Um, we just had a lecture out there on cave exploration that they love, or nutrition, or new advances in brain chemistry. Socrates, uh, uh, just uh, books, Plato books, I wouldn't even pick up. The prisoners who attend get no academic credit. This is simply an opportunity to learn. We're not trying to go in and change their lives. We're not trying to go in and lecture them about how to be nicer or... <laughs> um, this is really just intellectual enrichment, to give them something to think about, to give them a couple of hours to step out of their ordinary lives. It keeps you alive. All right. We first met this man in 2014. My name is Ronald McKeithen. I'm in here for first degree robbery. Been locked up over 33 years. Ronald McKeithen was convicted of several crimes in the 1980s. Burglary, fraudulent use of a credit card, and robbery. Under Alabama's Habitual Offender Act, he's serving life without parole. The lesser of two evils, I guess. He's a regular Everybody. at the lectures. What I like about this lecture, the UAB lecture series, you got Festers coming up here, and they so passionate about sharing what they know. And uh, I mean, for a while, like, I mean, that's my visit. You know, I don't get visits anymore that, that much. So, and these so people come to visit me. That's how I look at it. You have to do things to direct your mind in a constructive, positive way. And um, and a lot of guys want to change, and to change, you need options. And this lectures here, that they give you options. This rare opportunity is also reason for prisoners to behave. There is a selection process on who gets to attend. We put the information about classes out in our daily inmate newsletter, and from that point we get request slips in from the inmates, and we'll kind of go through a selection process, looking at a variety of things, mainly disciplinary history. If an inmate has recent, recently been in trouble, we normally uh, 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 select someone else. How many requests do y'all get? It, it hundreds. We get hundreds of requests. 20 to 25 men go to each lecture, but with a population of 1,500, that represents only 1.6% of the prisoners at Donaldson. 
Still, for those who are chosen, it's a coveted chance to interact with the outside world. My name is Gary Smith. I went ahead and, and volunteered and um, uh, it, was, it changed my life. Theater professor Dennis McLernan first lectured in 2007. And I brought no materials with me because, you know, I was going to work with everybody on their feet. And the, the one thing that started going through my mind was, what am I going to say to these men? And uh, just the voice inside of my head said, just tell them the truth. And that was, from then on, I was at peace with it. How are they different from the students that you teach at UAB? You know what? They're not different at all. They're not different at all. Here's all the evil things they've done. And There um, is one notable contrast. Unlike kind of college of students, time. these men don't have to be as here. Far as this History instructor piece, Jordan Bauer saw the difference when she lectured in 2014 on environmentalism. These guys were asking questions even before I started. I even had one uh, professor from the medical school uh, say to me that the inmates actually asked questions, better questions, than his first year medical students. Uh, <laughs> but it just shows you that the inmates are not stupid. They have an amazing sense of wisdom and understanding. I mean, there's a kind of directness about their questions that bypasses all the kind of smart cerebral stuff that we sometimes get into in academic classrooms. Dr. Allison Chapman first lectured on the Protestant Reformation. And I had to dial up my game part way through because I realized they, you know, they were already, you know, on top of things. After their first lectures, Chapman and McLernan both became regulars at Donaldson Prison. She taught literature classes. He ran an actor's workshop part of a network of academics at UAB that have shared their expertise for free with those who no longer have freedom. And this isn't an easy gig. Gary Smith is giving a talk about Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. I'm not an outsider, I'm an American These citizen. students are engaged, and sometimes it's a tough room. Are you a, you consider yourself a very humorous person? A very what? Humorous. I think I have been called funny before, yes. I didn't find nothing funny with it. I'm not saying that you did. That's oh, no. I, if I did that, I did not mean to communicate right. that at all. I apologize if it sounded that way. So, you may see these men and think, why should I care? Why does it matter to me if they're educated and rehabilitated? Here's why. Research shows programs like this make prisons and the public safer. Prisoners who participate in educational programs are 43% less likely to commit another crime. They, they have a total change of attitude. They're a lot less disruptive. Even when they leave the class, uh, they can go back to the dormitory, spread that knowledge to the other inmates, um, and it just helps the institution as a whole when they, when they do that. I don't see a, a downside. I wish that we could uh, provide it for, for more inmates at one time than, than we currently do. Programs work, they really do. Uh, the, the only shame is we just don't have more of them. A lot of, of, of these, these men come from uh, disadvantaged uh, homes, uh, communities, uh, uh, a lot of them with low socioeconomic status and, and environments. Um, I hear and see a lot of talk of uh, abuse uh, from their own families we got to start with providing them as much knowledge and rehabilitation and opportunity as possible. Because it's not just about them. It's about those people and those families and, and those children that are attached to them. So it's a bigger picture. Uh, my name is Cornelius Bridges. I've, um, I've been here around eight years and I have a 20 year sentence. I'm, uh, I'm in for robbery, first degree robbery. And how old are you? 25. I wasn't really educated when I came to prison. I was young. I, um, I ran the streets a lot. The streets and trouble met Cornelius Bridges early in life at age 14. 
Arrested in 2007, he pleaded guilty to six different robberies and was sentenced to 20 years. But that sentence was split, three years to serve, followed by probation. Cornelius did his time and got out on probation in 2010, but was quickly back in trouble, arrested in a suspected burglary. A judge granted the state's motions to revoke his probation and terminate the split sentence. That meant Cornelius went back to Donaldson prison, and even though the burglary charge was eventually dismissed, he would now be required to serve the full 20 years. His first chance at parole was denied earlier this year. My family and my friends have never given up on me, and for a while it didn't set in to me. And over time it did because I, I could see that not only am I going through things being here, but they are going through things being here with me. It's like they're doing the time too. He think he's a Prince Charming too. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. Cheryl Kennedy is his mother. Jessica Kennedy is his sister. Despite his mistakes, they love him. To them, Cornelius is still the protective son and annoying little brother, the child they nicknamed Clean. I would give anything to have the opportunity just for him to annoy me, for me to say, please just go in the other room. You know, like I miss that. I miss that it has been eight years since the four of us have been together for any holiday, any birthday. Cheryl says Clean started getting into trouble by trying to fit in. Riding in stolen cars, fighting, just hanging out with the wrong crowds. She tried punishing him. She tried scaring him straight. I took him to juvenile myself, and they told me that they couldn't do nothing for me. And I told them of the trouble he was getting in. Nothing, no programs, no, nothing. So why did Cornelius turn to crime? He sheds some light on that in this letter, writing, a lot of these guys aren't bad people. They pick up on these actions and behavior because it's what they see around them. It's what they are encouraged to do by peers who have been misled. They are caught up on this false depiction of what it means to live in the ghetto as young boys evolving into men. Cornelius closes with the hard lesson he's learned. The consequences that I received from being blind taught me to see life in its entirety. Today, the worry his family feels for their brother and son is constant. He's had a hard time in prison. He's called home crying, mm -hmm. saying he needed deodorant or he needed toothpaste. Mm -hmm. Worse, they say Cornelius was stabbed in a fight and developed a staph infection. I can't get to him, I can't help him. It's, uh, who did it, why, what are they doing to them? You can't do anything. Cornelius takes medication for high blood pressure, and earlier this year, his family says he suffered a stroke in prison. And we didn't know anything about it until a month later when he called us to let us know. What goes through your mind as a mom hearing about all that? They don't tell me a lot of stuff. <laughs> they didn't tell me. Cheryl's yeah, we, kids we, try to protect her from some things that are too much for a mother to bear. They focus on the positive, like Cornelius getting his GED behind bars and a certification in residential electrical work. His next chance for parole is 2019. What do you hope to do when you get out of here? I, I most certainly hope to um, to uh, take care of my family because my dad, he's, he's, he's uh, he has mental health issues. I plan to um, to have children. I plan to have a family because I really want a family and um, just continue to progress in life. It used to embarrass me. 
It, I used to be embarrassed by it. I wouldn't speak about him to anybody, but now I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm just as proud of him as I am of the rest of them. And all that you need now is the chance to be out here to prove himself. Well, jails that were supposed to hold a certain number of people were now bursting at their seams. So how did this unique program begin? He's not your normal smart boy. Um, he uh, was engaged and thoughtful and original in a way that doesn't come along very often. It started with that potential Professor Ada Long spotted in a young Casey Moore. It was 1987. He was a gifted straight-A student from Ragland in St. Clair County. She ran the honors program at UAB. And it took me maybe 20 minutes to figure out that this was really an exceptional young man. And kind of on the spot, I offered him one of our scholarships. So he was one of the first scholarship recipients in the honors program. But there was something about Casey Moore that Professor Long did not know. But now 26-year-old Missy Macon is dead. Police are saying very little about the murder. The body of Missy Macon was found in this convenience store. Police say they have a strong case against three local boys in connection. In a case that stunned this small town, Casey Moore was indicted for capital murder. Moore and two friends were accused of fatally shooting Missy Macon during a 1985 robbery at a convenience store. One of the boys is considered a genius. None of them had ever been in trouble with police. It was widely reported the three boys were deeply involved in role-playing fantasy games at the time. Macon was a young wife and mother working at the store to help support her family. Dr. Ada Long at UAB was stunned when she heard the news. By that time, I not only knew Casey as a, a student, but as a friend. Um, you know, we'd spent a lot of time together. And suddenly to find out that this person you know and feel you have a, a, a relationship with, a bond with, um, has been indicted for capital murder. It just was an adrenaline shock like no other. Casey, you anything to say? Casey Moore was the first to go to trial, which was halted when he overdosed on pills trying to kill himself. When Moore got out of the hospital, Casey Moore looked weak. And the trial resumed, and he could barely walk into court. But he was convicted of capital murder. Casey, you got any hopes about your sentencing this morning? Casey Moore was sentenced to life without parole. Co-defendant Scott Davis committed suicide, and Chris White served 17 years before he was paroled in 2005. A sensational case that shattered countless lives. So why would three intelligent young men do something so senseless? 28 years into his sentence, Casey Moore writes in a series of letters that he was a mentally ill, suicidal teenager at the time of the crime, and there was no rational motive for what they did. He writes, I deeply regret what I did and regret that I hurt so many people, not just Missy Macon, but also her family, my family, and everyone impacted by the crime I committed. It's hard for me to accept that I did something so horrible. Not a day passes that I don't think about it. And even after 30 years, I can't let it go. And that's probably the way it should be when a person does something that is both terrible and irrevocable. After Moore was convicted, Professor Ada Long did not forget about her promising student. I felt he was deeply imperiled, that he was very likely to kill himself, and that that would have been a terrible, terrible waste. Long is now retired, but remembers writing daily letters to Moore at Donaldson Prison and later visiting him every week. She was struck by the prison's lack of educational opportunity. I think people don't get that about prison. You know, it's dangerous not to use your mind. 
Dr. Long convinced Donaldson administrators to let her set up the UAB lecture series, booking dozens of professors to speak to prisoners every year, and she ran that program for 17 years. Casey Moore explains the value of the program, writing, If a prisoner is pondering the works of Milton or the lives of polar bears and penguins, it is far less likely that he will fall into the trap of hopelessness, drug abuse, and violence that is so typical of prison life. A rare perspective and a cautionary tale, Moore reflects on his own fate, writing, I understand that I made the kind of mistakes when I was young that bear lifelong, inescapable consequences. He is a good, a fundamentally good person who did a terrible thing. And um, there are many people in prison who are like this, particularly young people who are tried as adults. Rhonda Brownstein is Casey Moore's attorney. She says Moore has been a model prisoner, tutoring and teaching other felons, trying to make a difference with his life, lost to the outside world, but not wasted. Casey takes full responsibility for what he did. Um, he has never tried to evade responsibility or portray himself as the victim, despite the fact that I can see that he was barely 17, he was like a kid, with some serious problems growing up. That, um, but, but he's never made that excuse. The lecture series would never have come about without Casey. Um, if I hadn't met him, if I hadn't got to know him, this, this whole world would not have opened up to me. You know, this one really profoundly awful event managed somehow the dynamics of it to fan out in a beautiful way to make some difference in a whole lot of lives. It's made a difference and it's grown. Dr. Connie Kohler gave a one-time lecture yeah, on entertainment education and out of that it's not a big deal. grew this spin-off class. Door opening. Very bright, he's a very bright individual. I may have to speak with him. These prisoners are developing scripts about health issues unique to prison. This class is more intimate than the lectures. You anybody care about you if you don't care about yourself. One of many specialized classes professors have offered over the years after a single lecture inspires them to give more to this population. The amount of work they will put into learning about an issue is quite um, Impressive. I don't know, they're, they're working something really important out right now. Especially given the resources aren't really here. 145 employees. Another goal that comes from them is they want a wider audience to know what kind of people they are. Better yet, there are a lot of families that are out there now whose sons and uncles and brothers and a lot of fathers who are in here. What would they need? I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think, really, about how this place is, what has it done to me all these years of just being here. As long as I'm studying, learning more, developing more, growing more, okay, I can deal with it, you know? You know I can deal with it. As a society, we should want people to come out of prison not angry, not mad at the world, but ready to start becoming productive, contributing taxpayers. And to do that, we have to treat people like human beings. I think one of the saddest things would be for the people that come down and to not know how much we appreciate it. I would just like to know we appreciate it, that the changes they make in our lives. And sometimes I'll be I wonder, do they know? I learn from them. Years later now, I still consider those men my friends. If it's just some abstraction that nobody knows about, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just prison, and those are not really people. The minute you walk inside a prison and talk to prisoners, your world 
world changes. Then you suddenly, they become real and they're, they're people. Just like you.